Jesus said, pray that you may not come into the time of trial. In the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Palm Sunday's liturgies place significant emotional demands on the faithful. In the morning, we rejoice at Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, proclaiming, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yet, by the evening, we're set firmly on the road to Calvary, the road that we'll walk this holy week, accompanying our Lord from the Last Supper, through his betrayal, arrest, trial, and suffering, and to his crucifixion. As a means of focusing our prayer and meditation through this holy week, I'm going to reflect on a series of paintings which hang in the picture gallery at Christchurch here in Oxford. Each one illustrates a single episode from those momentous hours between Christ's eating of the Passover meal with his disciples and his death on the cross at the ninth hour of the following day. We have some way to travel, however, before we'll stand weeping at the foot of the cross on Good Friday. To begin our journey, I've chosen from the Christchurch collection an early 16th century image of Christ's agony in the garden, painted by an anonymous Byzantine painter working in Venice. The artist paints in a style that reflects both the meditative traditions of the Greek painting of icons for devotional purposes, and the influence of his encounters with contemporary Italian representations of landscape. The painting depicts a familiar episode from all four Gospels, which in each account provides a narrative transition from the Last Supper, celebrating the inner meaning of Jesus' gift of himself to all humanity, to the time of his trial and death, when he'll carry out that sacrifice. As the evangelists explain, Christ went out after the Passover meal with his disciples to pray on the Mount of Olives. Withdrawing from the others, whom he instructed to pray that they might be spared the time of trial, he went to pray alone and in great anguish. When he returned to the disciples, he found them sleeping. They were so worn out by their grief and emotional turmoil that they could not stay awake. Yet he remonstrated with them again, urging the need for prayer. Unusually for an icon style painting, this representation of the agony in the garden is not set against a gold background. More realistically, it depicts the landscape with the three hills on which the action takes place against a dark night sky. We might note the influence of Venetian painting in the artist's attempt at a realistic depiction of olive trees on the hills and the placing of flowers in the grass in the foreground. Look also at the city of Jerusalem in the middle distance, tucked behind the nearest right-hand hill. This image is also unusual in that it depicts not one event, but two consecutive scenes from the same narrative. At the top, as the focal point of the whole image, we see Christ, labelled by a Greek inscription at the top of the panel. He's kneeling in prayer and looking up to heaven. In the foreground, we see all 11 disciples, the 12 minus Judas, who had earlier gone out from the table into the night to betray Christ. They're all but one fast asleep, one shown at full length, lying on a sort of bed. On the right-hand side, Jesus has begun to rouse them, and Peter looks up at him as Christ says, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray. The representation of this intimate moment, when Jesus prayed by himself to the Father, draws us deeper into the mystery of his obedient faith, obedient even unto death. It forces us to reflect on his internal distress as he approached his death. Each of the Synoptic Gospels includes this scene, and all focus on Jesus' emotional turmoil and on his appeal to the Father to take the cup from him. In Mark and Matthew's accounts, Jesus prostrated himself on the ground, but in Luke's, as we see represented here, 
Christ knelt in an attitude that we readily recognise as one that we too use for prayer. The letter to the Hebrews reported that Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard for his godly fear. That author also dwelt on Jesus' obedience in accepting the cup and letting God's will, not his, be done. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Luke's distinctive contribution to this well-established tradition that Jesus endured powerful testing of his faith and obedience before his death lies in his focus centrally on Jesus rather than on Jesus in the company of the disciples. Luke's Jesus did not tell the disciples to wait while he prayed, nor did he single out Peter, James and John, as in Mark and Matthew's accounts. Instead, Jesus urged the group to pray that they might not come into the time of trial, echoing words that he had taught them in the Lord's Prayer, and his statements at the Last Supper about the need for faithfulness in the face of testing. Just as Luke concentrates our minds on Jesus' pain and anguish, the separation of the praying figure in our image is very stark. He may be only the distance of a stone's throw from his disciples, but Jesus appears wholly apart here, beyond any human comfort. To ease him in that anguish, our painter has added the angel who in some, but not all, manuscripts of Luke's Gospel was said to have appeared and ministered to him in his struggle. Although now badly damaged, you can just see the winged figure appearing from heaven in the top left of the painting. Luke's language of struggle, agonia, reminds us of athletic contest. The angel strengthens Jesus like a trainer, urging him on to more eager and fervent prayer. So great an effort does Jesus make that his sweat falls to the ground in great drops, as large as drops of blood. His emotional wrestling before his arrest foreshadows the still greater struggle that he will endure on the cross. The Father cannot spare Jesus from drinking the cup. And even as he prayed, Jesus knew that, yet not my will, but yours be done. So the strengthening angel prepared Jesus in order that when he rose from prayer, he would be ready for his approaching combat with the powers of darkness. The sweat that flowed as freely as blood testified to his readiness, hinting perhaps at his coming martyrdom. Just as he accepted the cup and the Father's will, we may remind ourselves of his words just a short time earlier at the table. This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. In the latter part of this Palm Sunday, we need firmly to set aside the joyful acclamations that marked our morning worship and begin faithfully to journey with Christ our Lord on the painful road to Calvary, praying as we do that we may not come into the time of trial. The images of Jesus' crucifixion and of his agony in the garden that preceded his arrest may help to concentrate our minds on his passion and on the agony of his struggle, as well as on his obedience to God's will. As we reflect, let us recollect words from the letter to the Philippians. Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.